Welcome to the discussion on disease management, rare kidney disease, and the implications of genetic testing. I'm Katherine Campbell. I'm a member of the National AAKP Board of Directors and an advocate in the great state of Texas. Currently, I have progressed to end-stage renal disease needing a transplant. I am involved with AAKP because they are the largest independent organization with a patient's voice for kidney patients. I currently participate in the planning committee for the annual meeting and the virtual visits on the Hill to advocate for policies and acts to improve care and treatment for kidney patients. I am pleased to introduce our speakers for today, both of which are longtime allies and advocates of AAKP. Mr. Richard Nelson is the founder and chair of the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation and current transplant recipient and, doc and Dr. Anna Greca who is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School in an associate position in the renal division in the Department of Medicine at, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, a founding director of NEXT at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and a member and director of the Broad Kidney Disease Initiative at the Broad Institute of MIT in Harvard. We are so pleased to have Richard and Dr. Greco here with us today. I will begin our session with Richard by posing a few questions as he shares his personal family story of living with rare genetic condition and how it inspired to create the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation and a close collaboration partner organization with AAKP. Richard, you have been involved in kidney health issues for three decades, both as a participant in research studies in, at the Mayo Clinic, Broad Institute, and Lake Forest Medical Center, and as a patient advocate speaking before medical meetings and global meetings. Do you think the role of patients in medical research is changing? And are patients more valued today than they were even a decade ago? Absolutely. Let me give you a 30 year perspective. The PKD Foundation uh, annual meeting, I attended 10 of 15 of those. I met the top kidney disease experts at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Vicente Torres and Peter Harris, and my mentor, Dr. Ted Steinman at Beth Israel and uh, Harvard. Uh, five of my children and 16 of their cousins tra have traveled to uh, Rochester to be tested. Uh, we've been in multiple studies over a 23 year period. Regardless of the medical insurance consequences, some patient families, I felt, we really needed to step up. And, uh, and this was before GINA or the Affordable Care Act. We need to be patient driven. Uh, like some of the national health organizations, uh, which have organized in a much better way over the past decade. Uh, much more with uh, national kidney and rare disease organizations. This has occurred in the last five years. Let me give you some examples. The AAKP's policy committee led by Paul Conway, the ASN's Health Alliance Initiative, which introduces patients like myself to members of Congress that are in our districts, uh, that occurred in May, the Rare Disease Legislation Advocates, uh, which is going to occur in September 22nd. Again, another organization 
that uh, connects patients with members of Congress. Let me talk about advocacy. National policymakers are finally listening. Uh, I get this from, uh, from my industry experience of being industry driven. I headed a uh, organization called TECNA, Technology Councils of North America, with 18,000 tech companies uh, as the CEO and uh, worked with uh, our executives. And also uh, nationally, we worked with, uh, or I worked with the uh, Council of Bi State Bioscience Associations. Again, this was a way to engage from an industry standpoint, uh, members of Congress, decision makers. Now let's talk about uh, our industry, our healthcare industry, and specifically our uh, kidney disease uh, area. Uh, we need to be patient driven, just like uh, industry is uh, industry driven. Uh, patient driven organizations are making a big difference. And I want to thank AAKP and the ASN, especially. Let me quote from your policy chair and uh, past president, uh, Paul Conway, and your current president, Richard Knight, from a recent uh, article in the uh, prestigious Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrologists, April 2021, quote, most significantly, the president's 2019 executive order armed kidney patients, us, with greater care choice and re, uh, reasserted patients into their rightful place as decision makers for their own care. Let me go to an action. A year ago, there was a virtual summit that our foundation hosted. Uh, it was global. We worked closely with Dr. Anna Greca of the Broad Institute. Uh, two, that was a two-day summit. Uh, it was uh, the first day, four hours, with a global meeting of the researchers. Uh, 87 were on uh, on that call. Uh, and then the next day was the, was the patient uh, section, four hours. Again, focused on what could patients do. Again, this is all the emphasis of Dr. Uh, Anna Greca, recognizing that patients really matter to research, they really matter to uh, getting approval, approvals from the FDA as they are uh, pursuing at the cur current time. I'd like to uh, give you two actions as part of my remarks today. One is a slide of uh, in involving yourself in this ATKD Global Summit. It's a two-day summit, again, the same format, shorter, two hours on each day. The first day is a fascinating a discussion globally on research updates. And you'll, you'll be especially interested to listen to uh, Dr. Anna Greca, who I understand is uh, part of this session. Second day is a patient family day. It's focused on us and what we can do to uh, support and accelerate uh, research and approvals by regulatory bodies like the FDA. Richard, clearly you have a passion for kidney disease and helping others. Advocacy and empathy for those suffering from kidney disease. Why have you invested three decades of your life in the fight against kidney disease and what fuels your passion? I retired to achieve uh, three lifetime goals. One of those was to accelerate help accelerate and uh, to find a treatment and a cure for our rare kidney disease called MUC1 or MKD or Mucin1. There are only 900 patients in the world that have been diagnosed with this disease, 220 families. This has become a very personal matter to me. Families really matter. MUC1 uh, first affected me at age 11, when I lost my young father, who was a, a, a surgeon when he was 43. 
uh, I really didn't understand why or, 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 or the, the ramifications of that. I had no idea that my grandfather, Andrew, had died at 36, and many of my uncles and aunts had died at the, uh, at the same uh, timeline in their 30s. I still don't know the full effect on our family of the Muck One mutant gene. Five years ago, I met a brilliant, young, driven scientist, an MD, PhD, at the Broad Institute, Dr. Anna Greca. What made her different? She, played the, she placed the highest value on patients, supporting the Broad's research. And she challenged us to get involved with patient advocacy. That's when we created the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation in 2018. I want to talk about a young family with much promise, my family. This is a Christmas card photo from December, to, or December 1956. I was eight years old, standing in front of my father. I want to focus on my uh, sister, just older than me. My dear sister, Marcia Ann, passed away four years ago at the age of 71 after 20 years of suffering on dialysis. She was my spiritual mentor and she was all about finding the silver lining in life. Essentially, hope. We have to have hope. That really impacted me. At age 38, with three young sons, I was diagnosed with PKD, polycystic kidney disease, which half of your offspring will get, as most of you know. I received a transplant four years later. In fact, I changed my birthday this year from January to February 16th, which was 30 years ago. Now that's something I want to celebrate every year, much more than my biological birthday. <laughs> Here's a quick snapshot of my father and grandfather, Andrew, and my great-grandfather, Rasmus, and the ages that they passed away due to this genetic kidney disease. No, they were all in their 30s, and we discovered recently one more of the five children of my, grand, of, of my great grandfather. There was a, a young sister uh, who died at age 26. Here's a prized 1960 Christmas photo when my uh, mother was uh, 40 and I was 11. I'm to the left of her. She was a young widow. And at that time, we didn't know that uh, four of the six of us would be diagnosed with Mach 1 or AD, TKD, kidney disease. Note my two sisters on her right, Marcia Ann and little Claire Marie, my younger brother behind me, is now in the hospital with uh, multi-organ failure. My two sisters, as I have also had this same disease. Little Claire Marie is doing very well in Chicago. This family experience is of watching the suffering of my siblings and going through a transplant myself has resulted in me becoming cause-driven in my life. That's really me. That's why I've been a community builder. I love this quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. But this is the way I see the world. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed scientists and patient advocates can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. That's what we can do. That's what we are doing. That's what this organization is doing. That's what my foundation is doing.
This is a uh, family reunion celebrating my father's 100th birthday on the shores of the great uh, Bear Lake in northern Utah in southern Idaho. We had over 100 there. There's six in my family, five siblings and myself, and here are all of our children. And now it's some grandchildren from there too, many of them. Uh, families matter, they really do. And especially large families that are willing to be engaged and willing to take up this cause of being patient driven and being tested. And that's what we have uh, elected to do. Richard, you've been involved in building major collaborative organizations, such as Technology Councils of North, North America and Utah, Utah Technology Council, which are nationally known innovations, technology and nonprofit leaders. Through the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation, you are using your skills and family story to raise the voice of rare disease patients. Can you share with us a bit more about the foundation? Let's, uh, let's talk about the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation. In meeting with Dr. Anna Greca in 2017, uh, she challenged us to get involved, to matter, to, uh, as I mentioned before, be patient driven. She challenged us to uh, help uh, expand the, uh, the small base of our rare disease. And so we created the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation as a result of that ch challenge. As you can see, this foundation, the Rare Kidney Disease Foundation is the patient voice for research. And we invite you to come and be involved with us and other organizations in a very, very collaborative way. As I mentioned in 2018 is when uh, this foundation was established. In September of 2020, as I mentioned, was the International uh, Summit for AD, TKD, uh, this, uh, which was followed up by a kickoff patient and family webinar, which was held and we had 27 attendees. In fact, one of the bright stories of our foundation is as a result of engaging with the 27. Uh, we met uh, Katie Reed, who who's, has a perfect skill set, has become our, C, our COO, and she's a, a professional project manager and driven uh, to uh, make a difference. She and her twin both had transplants in the last couple of years, and they're very concerned and are doing something about it. Again, get involved with this foundation that uh, the American Association of Kidney Patients or, or our foundation or a number of others uh, and, uh, and contribute. Dr. Greca has emphasized in the past year since that uh, summit, the urgency to, uh, uh, for uh, clinical trials before that this can be taken to the FDA for, uh, for approval. I'm sure she'll outline the uh, compound that uh, is very, very promising and exciting. I never thought in the 30 years I've been involved that this would happen, but I was hopeful. I mean, just like Margaret Mead said, there's got to be a way that we can solve these very difficult issues. The first ever therapeutic treatment for kidney disease is uh, what she'll talk to you about and uh, is what we're involved with. And we're one of the uh, lead patient family in the, uh, in, the, in the studies leading up to the FDA uh, application. There's a lot of hope. So, so what, what is our foundation doing? First of all, it's increasing awareness like we're doing today. And we're doing that not only with you, the patients, but as soon as we get some more formal good news, we'll reach out to the nephrology community, medical community, and then the uh, broader community. This is all about building a community. It's like I did in the tech industry. Now, 
It's all about building a patient community to support the uh, incredible work of uh, the scientists that are moving uh, moving these uh, treatments, uh, therapeutic treatments forward. And it's all about advocacy and having our voice matter. And uh, that may sound uh, like it's difficult, it's not. In fact, uh, you can contact me, I'd welcome. I'd welcome you being involved with me, with these other foundations that I'm involved with. So what can you do? Let's just go through these bullets. Uh, you can learn about AD, TKD, and also specifically MUC1 or UMOD or REN, the underlying uh, genes that cause this kidney disease. As I mentioned earlier, we thought for over 20 years we had PKD. And then the Mayo Clinic referred us to the top geneticist there, Peter Harris, referred us to the Broad. He said, I think that this is what you have, not polycystic kidney disease, even though I had the privilege of being on the PKD board for a period of time. Bullet number uh, two. This is really important. Contact us you have an undiagnosed genetic kidney disease. It could be a form of AD, TKD. And uh, there is a genetic test available. Let me give you a little background on this. I want this to be a tangent, but I think it's important in working with a number of nephrologists. You know, obviously our kidney disease is caused by by, by diabetes and hypertension. And then you get into the diseases. The main one is, is PKD and maybe something like 10% of the kidney failure population. And then a subset of that uh, disease area, maybe 10% of that. Nephrologists are unable to uh, diagnose. Well, I'm convinced as well as many others that there is that uh, MUC1, this mucin one kidney disease, UMOD, REN, and other rare diseases that fit into this AD, TKD, haven't been diagnosed yet, but now there, there is a way for them to be diagnosed and there is a test and there is a financial way to do that. We've had all 21 of my five children, not 21 children, but five children, and their 16 cousins tested it. The, first of all, at the, uh, the Mayo Clinic years ago and in the last uh, five years, all have been tested by the uh, Wake Forest and, uh, and the Broad Institute. Third bullet, attend the Global Summit, 19th and 20th of November. Take an hour, take two hours, pick a, pick a topic. If you want to talk about research, join us on the 19th. If you want to know what you can do on, in the patient area, join us on the 20th. Each one is a two hour session. Maybe you'll be the Katie Reed Morrison that we can discover that will come and uh, matter. Shouldn't be the Nelson Rare Kidney Disease Foundation. It ought to be all of our Rare Kidney Disease Foundation, especially if you uh, have AD, TKD uh, as, as, a, uh, as a disease. Next bullet, uh, join the Facebook, the uh, AD, TKD Research Facebook. And then uh, jo uh, contact us at rarekidney.org. Uh, and join our distribution group. Again, there are, uh, there are ways for each of us, even if we're on dialysis. Again, I've got a, my younger brother's on dialysis. He's in the hospital right now, ICU, multi-organ failure, five years younger than I am. Uh, not expected uh, to last much longer. Um, it's a heartbreak to see him suffer a heartbreak to see my sister suffer, suffer. It's a heartbreak to know that you're suffering. So please uh, do something. 
even if you're not feeling that well, just be hopeful and come and be involved with a patient-driven organization. Let's wrap up. I want to thank the American Association of Kidney Patients. Richard Knight, Paul Conway, Diana Kleins for the invitation and the privilege to present. I hope there's been some good. I hope there's been a, a kernel of something that you can get out of my uh, experience. There is tremendous hope. There's tremendous progress. And a lot of it recently in the last five to 10 years is all about patient driven organizations and us contributing to this cause. Let me summarize the two actions that I mentioned. Again, patient, being patient driven really matters. I found this out in my career, building a tech uh, community. Uh, first action, register, come and invest one or two hours in our global AD, TKD virtual summit on the 19th or 20th. Second, if you're undiagnosed with your kidney disease, contact our foundation. As I mentioned earlier, there's a very, there's a small percentage of those that have these diseases, specifically PKD, or these rare diseases that I found that I had, I have. Uh, but there's about 10% of the nephrologist, nephrologists tell me, there's probably as many as 10% that they can't say why the patient has that disease. Well, there's a way to find out. It took me 23 years to find out, and I was very assertive at it. Having my family uh, involved at the Mayo Clinic, all those years and then at the Broad Institute and Wake Forest in more recent years. It's been a privilege uh, presenting to you today. I hope there's a kernel that uh, you got. There's tremendous hope, especially when, when we're involved with this cause and contributing as patients. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. We so appreciate your personal family journal with kidney disease and how you're committing your life to helping others with rare genetic diseases. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Greta to present. Hello, everyone. It is a great and special pleasure uh, to be with you today. I'm very grateful to the leadership of the AKP for inviting me. And um, uh, it's really a wonderful honor to be able to speak to you um, about our work. Uh, my name is Dr. Anna Greca. I am um, at Harvard Medical School, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and at the Broad Institute of uh, MIT and Harvard. I am a doctor, a nephrologist, as well as a scientist. And uh, my mission is really to identify treatments for kidney diseases. Today, I wanted to share with you some of our work uh, on two rare kidney diseases that we have been studying in my group and also uh, speak with you about how understanding the uh, implications of genetic testing can really help us to build uh, new treatments, much needed treatments for kidney diseases. So in order to frame uh, the question for today, this idea of uh, what is the purpose of genetic testing? Why would we even care about genetic testing as patients or as family members, as caregivers? Uh, the answer is really encapsulated in this slide. We as physicians and scientists um, can really build treatments by going from genes to mechanisms to medicines. But the only way that we can do this, the only way we can fulfill what I call the arc of discovery is by um, uh, having partnerships with patients like yourselves so that we can uh, do genetic testing to detect the genes that cause diseases. Once we do that, as is shown um, on the left, uh, we can then begin to understand how these genes um, uh, conspire, if you will, to cause problems inside cells in our bodies. And once we have a handle on these mechanisms, then we can truly build medicines. In fact, we can build what we call precision medicines, which to me means giving the right patient the right treatment at the right time, which of course is what we all want to do. 
For example, I wanted to share with you a, a really exciting project at the Broad Institute. Um, this is a project of partnering with patients that is not specific to kidney disease, but it actually um, is targeting patients and their families across many different rare diseases. We call it the Rare Genomes Project, um, as shown here. And this is a collaboration between uh, many hospitals in the Boston area, including my own, the Brigham, um, as well as the Broad Institute. And our goal is essentially to reach as many patients across the United States as possible uh, to try to decipher, to unlock the secrets of these rare diseases that often affect children as well as young adults, um, but really uh, uh, patients at any age. Um, and again, this is uh, the idea of being able to uh, use genetic testing as a tool for us to begin this journey of discovery toward the development of medicines. For example, this is a map of all the different patients all across the United States who have participated in this project and continue to participate in this project. And I'm showing you also um, in the bottom corner, um, Heidi Rehm and Jamie Marshall, two of my colleagues who are uh, working with me on this project. Um, as I mentioned, this is a project uh, that is targeting patients with all kinds of rare diseases, but it includes kidney disease. And so I invite you to check out this website um, and really um, see how you might be able to partner with us uh, to unlock uh, the secrets of rare kidney diseases so that we can begin that journey of uh, building therapies. So today, I actually wanted to share with you um, some recent discoveries about two rare kidney diseases that we are currently working on in the lab. They're currently under um, active investigation. Uh, and these two rare diseases are called MUC1 kidney disease, or MKD, and UMOD kidney disease, or UKD. They're also known, you might see them, uh, with these very um, complicated acronyms, ADTKD, which stands for autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease. That's truly a mouthful, but ADTKD MUC1 and ADTKD UMOD are these two diseases that uh, my research team um, at the Broad Institute and Brigham and Harvard um, is working on. Uh, this is again, uh, a genetic disease. It runs in families. Uh, it affects every generation in these families. I know you will be uh, meeting with um, a patient who can tell you his personal story and journey with one of these diseases. So it will really, um, hit home exactly how uh, this disease affects really every generation uh, in these families. And the big problem is that these diseases are silent until they finally cause kidney failure. And I'm sure that this will resonate with many of you because of course, many of you have different forms of kidney disease or you have a loved one with kidney disease. And you know well that sometimes uh, the disease can be silent until it finally uh, becomes discovered. So um, this is uh, true for these families as well. Um, and our research, the research that we did in the lab, as I'm about to show you, um, actually has uh, shown that these two diseases are similar. They basically have the same underlying mechanism. Um, and uh, that mechanism really has to do with the accumulation of a mutant uh, toxic protein uh, in the um, kidney cells of these patients. Uh, and so with this recognition, we as scientists and as doctors, we are now actively looking uh, for a treatment that might uh, help address both of these diseases simultaneously. And so this is um, exciting times, uh, and I would love to share a little bit about these discoveries so that I can um, help um, all of us uh, realize just how important it is uh, to do genetic testing and to have partnerships with patients uh, so that we can make progress uh, in these disease areas. So this story really begins with the hard work of uh, scientists in the group. For example, Mohand Vela, who I'm showing on the bottom uh, corner here. Um, she uh, looked at the kidneys uh, in biopsies from patients with this disease, as is shown at the top. And as you can see, there are, there are these holes, if you will, in the kidney that look very abnormal. And Mohan decided that she needed to build a mouse model, which is often what we do in the lab. Um, and she worked really hard uh, along with other team members to ultimately develop a mouse model that really resembles for all the world um, the human disease, uh, as shown on the bottom here. You can see that over time, these mice also develop the same holes, if you will, in the kidney, just like the patients. And this was a really key uh, discovery, a key, a key tool, if you will, that Mohan built um, so that we can uh, begin to study the mechanism of this disease. 
This disease is caused by a mutation um, in, a, in a gene called mucin-1 or MUC1. But what is more important is that Moran developed a way to visualize the results of that mutant gene. And the results of the mutant gene are the development of a mutant toxic protein that accumulates in the kidneys. Um, this is true in patients, but also in these mice. Mohan developed a way to basically color this protein green. Uh, it's a specific antibody that she used. Uh, the technical terms don't really matter, but this is a way for her to know that whenever there's green, that means there's toxic protein that's accumulating. And as you can see in the kidney of this mouse, there is a lot of this toxic protein that accumulates and it truly seems to accumulate where the problem seems to be, which is the areas of all these holes uh, in the kidney. So we were starting to make some progress toward understanding how this gene, this mutation in mucin-1, results in the generation of this toxic protein that accumulates in the kidney. So of course, what we wanted to uh, understand next is if we look at the cells under the microscope, those kidney cells, as are shown here, can we see the toxic mutant protein accumulate? And as you can see here in green, uh, again, scientists in, uh, in the team, on the, in the group, were successful in visualizing this protein. And as you can easily see, it accumulates in these um, kidney cells. And so that actually gave us a tool. We basically then wanted to know, okay, now that we know exactly how the cells look under the microscope and how this green toxic protein accumulates, can we find a way to make it go away? That was our what we call therapeutic hypothesis. We wanted to know whether we can devise a way to get rid of this mutant protein. So what exactly goes wrong in the kidney? Remember I told you that there's a mutant gene that causes um, the problem. So this is, let's say, a mistake in the DNA in the kidney cells. That generates a toxic protein that accumulates in kidney cells. The toxic protein accumulates in kidney cells and causes the cells to ultimately die. When the cells die, we develop holes in the kidney. The cells are gone, so there are these holes that develop in the kidney. Um, and ultimately, over time, that leads to kidney failure. This takes place over the course of many years. There's a lot of wear and tear, if you will, in the kidney that results from this initial mutant gene that causes the problem. And understanding this entire mechanism was an important piece of the puzzle that would let us now try to discover a way to get rid of this toxic protein. So Moran collaborated with another uh, excellent scientist in the group, Masha Limova, as shown in the pictures on the uh, bottom left. And what they were looking for was a way to screen through what ended up being many years and thousands of different drugs, thousands of different images of these cells that I'm showing you here. But what that ultimately led to was the discovery of one effective drug that uh, really was able to do exactly what we set out to do, which was to remove the toxic protein. As you can see, there's a lot of green on the left, but there's not a whole lot of green left on the right. So treatment of these kidney cells with this drug was really successful in a way that we could barely believe when we first saw it. Um, it was really successful in removing this toxic protein. So we were very pleased uh, by this uh, discovery. Of course, we wanted to go beyond the kidney cells uh, we, in, the, in the dish under the microscope. We also wanted to look at the mice. And as you may remember, these are the mice that develop the disease similar to humans. And green is bad, as you recall. So here's a mouse uh, on the far left that has a lot of toxic protein accumulating in the kidneys. And the sibling of this mouse that also had a lot of that uh, green toxic protein received the drug for about a week's time. And as you can see in the middle, that resulted in a lot of that green toxic protein being removed. The normal mouse is shown on the right for comparison so that you can actually see that the mouse that received the treatment was beginning to look a whole lot more like a normal mouse than like a mouse with the disease. So again, this told us that this drug that we had discovered not only works uh, in the cells, in the petri dish, but it also works in mice. Of course, what we really want this uh, to do this drug uh, to do is to actually work in patients and the drug that we initially discovered in cells that works in mice is not quite suitable to be given to patients as yet so we have a lot more work to do and we have a lot more um, specialists and scientists to work with for example chemists who can make um, better drugs uh, ones that patients can take that humans can take so we are actively working um, on this and we are making great progress 
But ultimately, what we need in order to uh, be able to see whether this would be um, a treatment for patients is to actually partner with patients to make this happen. And so a key ingredient now in this process of going from gene to mechanism to medicine is actually you, the patients. Um, we discovered that we had to uh, assemble a group of patients uh, with this disease because it didn't exist. Uh, this is called a registry. And so together with collaborators at Wake Forest, Dr. Tony Blyer and his team, um, other collaborators in faraway places like Cyprus and Prague, for example, as well as my colleagues at the Broad, we have initiated, uh, back in 2015, in, in fact, we initiated this uh, patient registry that has grown and grown through efforts of patients, much like Richard Nelson, who uh, you um, are meeting today. Uh, and this registry has grown quite a bit in the last few years, such that now we have about 1,900 patients in the registry. And of course, we have a lot more work to do, both to grow the registry, as well as to now work with the patients uh, who are part of this registry as we advance a treatment in clinical trials so that ultimately we may have hopefully a cure uh, for these diseases, uh, these two rare kidney diseases. But as with all rare diseases, what we are dealing with is actually what I call the tip of the iceberg. So the patients who are currently in our registry, we're very happy that we have them and we're learning so much from them, but they really are only the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more patients out there who we don't know, so many more families who are still undiagnosed with this disease. And so what we need and what my um, message is today is that we need your help, the help of all kidney patients so that we can find more patients with these diseases so that we can help more patients down the road. And so I will ask you to please spread the word and to uh, definitely let um, patients and friends and family members know that the testing is free for all. This is uh, research level testing that is free for all. And uh, this type of testing can truly enable us to increase the numbers of patients in our registry and really be able to do the uh, necessary clinical trials that will get us uh, to treatments. So again, uh, based on the uh, slide that I showed you earlier on, my job as a doctor and a scientist is to really fulfill this arc of discovery from genes to mechanisms to medicines. And in order to do that, we need genetic testing. It enables us to identify the genes that cause the disease. And here for these two diseases, we have already done that. Then we can decipher the mechanisms that cause these diseases. And again, I showed you today how we have recently been successful in accomplishing this for these two diseases. But now we are faced with the task of implementing successfully clinical trials so that we can ultimately develop these treatments for patients uh, with these kidney diseases. And so again, genetic testing and having more people, uh, more patients join us in this registry will be very enabling for us to be able to successfully um, bring more patients into these clinical trials so that we can um, test these drugs and have enough numbers of patients to do the appropriate statistics that are needed so that we can see whether our drugs are effective. And so again, genetic testing is very enabling for us to be able to go from genes to mechanisms to medicines, as I have been describing to you today. And so of course, everything that I have shown you today could not be done by one person. There's a huge team of doctors and scientists who deeply care about patients and deeply care about um, diseases and solving uh, these puzzles. Um, and so uh, there's a wonderful team of collaborators in my lab um, and uh, many collaborators across uh, really every part of the world. Um, I am particularly thankful to all of you, all of the patients who have generously partnered with us in our research thus far. And I hope that my message today is heard that I invite many more of you to be involved in our research and learn more about what we do. Um, again, it's been a unique and special privilege uh, to be with you today. I want to thank um, the leadership of the AAKP for this very kind invitation. And again, I'm so thrilled to be with you and to be able to uh, connect with as many patients as possible as we move toward um, treatments for kidney diseases. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Greca, and thank you, Richard. We appreciate both of you sharing with us your time today, your experience and your expertise. Thank you so very much.